morning, Your Honors. Roy Watson, representing the appellant, who is here in the courtroom and with my co-counsel. And this is a case in which uh, the defendant, Soroka, was found by the jury to have defamed Dr. Murphy, to have intentionally inflicted emotional distress on her, to have uh, conspired with the other defendant, Nicole Monroe, who also defamed my client. <coughs> well, the, the issue on this appeal is not what the jury found. The issue is what the trial court did. ultimately found. So why don't we address the trial court's ruling, because that's really what controls. <coughs> yes, Sean, but the, of course the jury, uh, jury's findings are uh, highly relevant and uh, how are they relevant to whether or not there's there's either a, an absolute privilege or a qualified immunity don't we have to look at the legal issues uh, as opposed to what the jury's finding was it is relevant because the defendant Soroka made it relevant by asking for a jury instruction and a verdict form asking the jury whether or not uh, that he was acting within the course and scope of employment because when, when uh, the defendant, a, a public official or employee, is not acting within the course and scope of employment. But the case law, the case law all says that these are issues to be decided by the court, not by the jury. So the trial court unfortunately recognized uh, the legal standard after the verdict, or perhaps recognized it before the verdict, but deferred its ruling until after the verdict. But the case law seems to all very unequivocally say that these are issues that must be determined first as a threshold issue, whether or not there's an absolute privilege, for example, must be determined by the trial court, not the jury. Well, in those cases, the defendant did not himself ask for a jury instruction and say this should be a jury issue. And I'll cite for uh, the court, at the beginning of the trial, defense counsel for Soroka argued that the question whether his client was acting within the course and scope of employment, quote, is still for the jury. That's at page 14 of the transcript. So your argue is, argument essentially is there was a waiver, waiver. Exactly. of the trial court making these findings. Exactly. There, wa there was a waiver. Uh, again, at the... Um, he said, the question on the verdict form should be, quote, was defendant Eric Soroka acting within the course? Uh, parties can, parties can uh, agree to, uh, oh, my counselor, my, my co-counselor, Mr. Cuny, reminds me I didn't reserve five minutes for rebuttal. You want five minutes? Okay. Thank you. No problem. Parties can change the, the rules of, of law if they want to and make something a jury finding when it uh, should be a, a court finding. Uh, and by the way, to the extent that it is a question of law for the court, uh, this court should uh, follow the at least three judicial determinations that uh, Mr. Soroka was acting outside the course and scope. Uh, in the federal case that was the first one filed. Um, could, you, could you address Risha v. Tucker for me? Because in that case, the issue was submitted to the jury, and after the jury's verdict, the trial court then made the ruling, and, and the, and the uh, Florida Supreme Court said it was air for the trial court to submit the issue to the jury. The, the, the case does not indicate that uh, the, the defendant uh, consented to the issue going to the jury or asked for it to go to the jury. Um, for all I know, I, I assume that by the fact that the court held it was error to submit it to the jury, that that issue was preserved by an objection to the issue going to the jury, which is not what we have here. Was there any evidence that this uh, conduct was outside the scope of the employment? Absolutely, positively, because <clears throat> um, Statements made after Dr. Murphy was terminated um, to the Miami Herald. They were published far beyond uh, the, the community of Aventura, much less. You know, some of these defamatory statements were made to city commissioners, all right? Uh, their argument is made that that's within the course and scope because you're explaining why you fire someone. When you talk to parents of the students, that's a little farther away. When you publish well, actually, this... I mean, regarding a uh, city-owned school, wouldn't talking to the parents about why the principal was removed relate to the city-owned school and therefore relate to the city well, business? 
But when you get to talking to the Miami Herald and publishing that far and wide from from the from the city, that is well, but definitely even, outside. And even before, that, I mean, it's a city-owned school. The public's going to be interested in why a principal was removed. So part of the city manager's responsibility would be talking to the public about why the principal was removed. I mean, I'm not trying to defend malicious statements, but I mean, in terms of the course and scope of the employment, it would seem to be a city manager who said, I'm not taking any questions from the public regarding why the principal was removed, um, might uh, be doing a disservice to the public and might not be doing his or her job. Well, these, these comments were published not just to the uh, community, too, but they were published uh, and read by prominent education organizations. But, but I think the point is, is that the comments dealt with his job. You know what I mean? It wasn't, it wasn't like he was talking about something not related to his job. He was being asked, why did you, why was this principal, why did you fire this principal? We, the public, have, a, this is public business. We have a right to know. Those comments were part of a whole orchestrated movement including and I, I'll move to for, for a minute to the intentional infliction there there, there can be no doubt that sending well, let, let me before you get to intentional infliction I, I'm, I'm curious about an answer from there because it, uh, my understanding of your argument and correct me if I'm wrong is that it may have been within the scope to have talked to parents or talked to the commissioners but it was not within the scope of this gentleman to give an interview to the Herald and discuss it with the Herald that's right, and also to, for it to be, you know, to be uh, disseminated to education organizations and out, international education consultant. Um, it had it. It had nothing to do with um, the administration of the city of Aventura government. Well, but it, it was, was, uh, it was a city on school. You would agree, yeah. as to Mr. Soroka, that he's a public uh, official, correct? You agree he's a public official. Yes serving as the, as the manager. So then, if you, would you agree that there's an absolute privilege if the statements that he made um, were within the scope of his duties? That we don't look to the content of the statements. They could be malicious. They could be false. We don't look to the content. If they were made within the scope of his duties, then they're absolutely privileged. You would agree with that? Yes, sir. So then the, the sole issue as to whether he has an absolute privilege for those statements would be whether they were made within the scope of his employment. And six jurors found they were not within the course of scope. A Judge Platzer found in, the, in uh, denying a motion for summary judgment that those facts were, were not within the course of scope. Okay, and what uh, is the re and just share with us, the reason it's not in the course and scope, I mean, I, I mean, we can't just simply, you know, rubber stamp the jury, right? I mean. We're trying to understand what really happened. We have to do an illegal analysis in terms of was it within the scope, scope of his employment. But I get the fact that other people might think it was outside the scope of the employment. But that's not much of a rationale. I mean, what is it, it's outside the scope of the employment because because it was so. And I think there's two two levels of maliciousness. I think that just maybe if it was just ordinarily malicious. I'd agree with Judge Rothenberg that. But the case law does not say that. The case law is very clear on the issue that it says you don't look to. It doesn't matter how malicious it is. It doesn't matter how false it is. You don't look to that that issue in terms of absolute privilege. You look at all, two things solely. You know, was this a public official, mm -hmm. and was it made within the scope of their responsibilities or duties? I think that the court should look at whether or not this. Uh, Allegation by the defense that it was within the course and scope of his duties is a pretext. If he if he is so utterly, superly malicious that he's using that as a pretext, and that it would, why uh, did the Herald ask him for his opinion? I'm and why did the Herald ask Sirocco for his opinion? I mean, why didn't they ask the city manager of Carl Gables? Hey, why do you think Sirocco was fired? I mean, why do you think this principal was fired? They in, they asked. Sirocco, the city manager of Aventura, and of course, why was he being asked? It's because it was a city school, right? And he's the city manager. And it's like, hey, pal, the buck stops with you. What happened here? And that's part of his job, is to explain the government actions to the public, it seems to me. Well, I, I believe it was more than just the statements. I believe that 
that uh, the intentional infliction was part of the whole thing. Well, I, I mean, it raises an interesting problem, is what if you have a city official trying to defend his decision or her decision by saying false things about individuals and false and defamatory things? So, I mean, that, that is an interesting question. You know, should the law really look the other way when that happens? But in terms of whether he was responding to a question in the course and scope of his employment, you know, I, I, it seems to me that it was. And the law seems to say if it is absolute privilege, for whatever reason, the policy of the law is government officials can't be sued for these type of statements made in the course and scope of their employment. Well, uh, the, jury, the jury found found against that position. The jury, uh, the issue was... Um, submitted to the jury with the agreement, with the request by the defendant. Uh, your, argument is it back. your argument is it goes back to the waiver issue. It was waived, therefore the trial judge was incorrect and in taken away from the jury. It was waived and the jury then found on listening to the evidence of, of, of why did he make the statements to the uh, newspaper? That was, they found that that was outside the course. Outside and the course. So even if, even if Your Honor, as a trier of fact, might come to a different conclusion based upon that evidence, the fact that it was turned into a factual inquiry. Well, it's just that, I mean, I, I mean, I've asked you several times, and you, in all fairness, Mr. Watson, I don't think you've given me any. What would be the facts that would indicate this wasn't related to his work? Yes, because whether the trial that. court whether the trial court did it or this court would do it on appeal, it would be the same analysis. What evidence would support the jury's verdict that yeah. any of these statements were made outside the course of Mr. Soroka's responsibilities? Yeah, so it doesn't it, matter that the trial court did it. It would be in the same posture here before us if the trial court didn't do it. And for that matter, as you know, I mean, if there's a reasonable inference that can be drawn that this is outside the course and scope, then we could give deference to the trial court or it the was, jury. But there, but there still has to be a some fact from which you could reasonably infer that this was outside. The it was outside the course and scope because he was trying to 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 ruin her nationwide, not just to support but, what but he did Mr. in that, the that, city. That troubles me, that argument. If you look at McNair, uh, which is Florida Supreme Court, McNair versus Kelly, it says, it seems to be well settled in this state that words spoken or written by public servants in judicial or legislative activities are protected by absolute privilege from liability for defamation. However, false or malicious or badly motivated the accusation may be, no action will lie, therefore, in this state, nor is it questioned that such an absolute immunity in the state extends to the county and municipal officers, and so on. It, it makes it very clear. This is Florida Supreme Court law, which we're bound to follow, whether we like it or not, whether we think it's reasonable or not that you do not look, you, it doesn't matter how malicious, how false, it doesn't matter what the intent was, you don't, you don't go there. There is an absolute privilege if it was made within the scope of his duties. What I was trying to convey was, by, if, if, if he made the statement that was partially within the course and scope, but it was also for another purpose. In other words, he makes the statement, say he makes the statement to a city commissioner, but he makes it in such a way so that somebody in Timbuktu um, is, is, um, is turned off by Dr. Murphy and won't hire her, it's not just within the course and scope. It could be, if it's within the course and scope in part, but also outside in part, which I believe it was by the distribution through the Miami Herald, he's trying to ruin it. It's not just the level of maliciousness, but it was his intent to go outside the course and scope in addition to. So the same statement can be both within and without. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's what we have here. Went, went, went beyond what the scope of the duty was. And when we, the moment he goes on beyond the scope of the duty, then that, that's done away with, because your argument is going to Commissioner at least the way I understand it. Going to the commission, uh, maybe to the parents is okay, but once you start publishing to the parents, publishing to different national magazines, et cetera, you're going beyond what your scope of duty is. Am I correct? Yes, and so just the fact that part of it was, part of it was when the, the course and scope is not dispositive. The, the totality. Now, interesting. I mean, because it, it, 
So the city official has a, has a subjective motive that is outside the course and scope. Uh, sure, I have to answer this, but in the meantime, I'm going to destroy this uh, educator's uh, theory of education or whatever. Now, if we accepted that argument, what would happen to the absolute privilege? Because it would seem to me one could always argue that. In other words, this, this, this statement is so malicious that it must indicate an intent other than being in the course and scope. Not just, too, too, not just so malicious, but it's too wide of an audience. I mean, there are times when, when your, your public duty um, has to be restricted to, to doing the public duty. It's, it's, it, it takes me into to the, um, the qualified uh, privilege arguments of, of Nicole Monroe. Um, well, that's an another whole issue, and I think Mm -hmm. if, you, you know, if you'd like you, to switch to that, I'd really there's some issues I'd like to address on that. But 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 where you have a, a publication made to too wide an audience, there there's there's no privilege there. And so, if uh, well, and asked Monroe, it's a different analysis because it's not an absolute privilege. And so, as to Monroe, if it's if it's um, if it's proven that there was either malice or bad faith or that it went to a wider audience than what was necessary, then it, it, those, it waives the qualified privilege that she enjoys. I think that so wider... Her, her post, the posture of her appeal is very different than Soroka, who had, has an absolute privilege. Hers is qualified, and the qualified privilege can be waived by one or, or the other of those two things. If, it's, if there's malice shown or it's too broad an audience. And I think the absolute privilege also can be waived if it's too broad an audience. And with that, I'll move on to the intentional infliction, because I think that beyond uh, that, that, that this ties in with, with uh, the defamation. But here he was using these uh, police officers as his own private militia. He sent them to her house twice, unlawfully, two counties away. As a what, is, what is so outrageous? or offensive or frightening to have a police officer come to the front gate of your condominium association and hand some papers to your husband that says, here are your terminate, here's the termination papers. What is so outrageous about that? I, I just, for the life of me, don't understand that argument. This I understand the, 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 the other statements and comments that he allegedly made who, that were outrageous. But police officer delivering some papers, I, I just don't a, see the outrageousness of that. An internationally prominent educator living in an upscale neighborhood with uh, uh, have two, two cops come up to her front door armed on two different occasions, it look, making her look like a, a criminal. They, her, they didn't even come to the front door on two occasions, so that's not even a fair representation of the, of the record. But even assuming that they did. Police officers coming to your door, knocking on your door, and handing you papers, and serving you with, you know, saying, "Here are your termination papers." In intimidating her with a uh, a show of of force, threatening her with arrest if she ever comes back. She can't go back to the city to pick up her personal belongings that are there in her office. And this was just the culmination of months and months and months of of just total improper conduct by. Mr. Soroka, cursing at her, calling her a hooker, calling her a whore, uh, yelling those, at her. Those are the, those are, I think, are the real issues. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what the alleged conduct was and whether that rises to the level of outrageousness that would entitle your client to, to the verdict for the, for the uh, uh, infliction of emotional distress. Yes, and I think that the level of outrageousness uh, I, I think that something can be and should be deemed to be outrageous under the circumstances when you have pillars of the community, you have public officials. Uh, you can get away with a lot less, in my opinion, by cursing, um, demeaning, uh, accusing. When you are, uh, this is not two guys in a pool room yelling at one another that uh, and cussing at one another. These supposedly are the cream of the crop, the, the, the upper crust. And so uh, by 
But, but, going, but does that really matter when you're talking about the definitions and, and the terms that are used? I mean, I, I, I would be in total agreement with you that the, if these words were in fact used, they're outrageous and it's terrible. But the question is, does it rise to the level of being so outrageous that it has to arise to in the context that it was used? I think that's where we are. It doesn't matter if it's uh, uh, the Vanderbilts and the Astors or, you know, I mean, it, it, that doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned. My two fellow judges may disagree with me. So explain to me how it arises. I think that's what Judge Rothenberg was asking you. I didn't hear that last I think that's what Judge Rothenberg was asking you, and I'm interested in it also. Well, it's just you know, you got to look at, at the effect that it, that it had on her. I mean, okay. uh, while two police officers going to a door. No, no, I'm not talking about the police officers. Oh. I'm talking about the comments that were made to this lady. There's like 14 or 15 different comments that were made using the word slut, et cetera. I won't go into them. That, that I agree that it's outrageous. My question is, does it rise to the level that you need here? Oh. And why? Why does it? Well, the, the jury so found, and while there are cases that, that say this, is, this can be a question of law, uh, I'd ask the, the court to go with um, Williams versus City of uh, Maniola, cited uh, in the amicus brief uh, by the uh, National Employment Lawyers Association for Justice Association, whose presence is here today, and we thank them for their action, uh, where the Fifth District recognized that the issue is properly one for the jury unless, quote, the facts of the case under no conceivable interpretation could support the tort. And here I believe, as I was saying, because of the status of the parties and the circumstances, uh, there are conceivable interpretations that could support the tort here, so it should be a jury question, and we shouldn't second-guess the jury. Gotcha. Mr. Rawson, we, we've taken you over. I'm going to let you have your five minutes for rebuttal, but we've, we've, we've taken you over your time. Uh, but uh, I'll let you have that. May I say in sitting down that N Nicole Monroe's <laughs> abused her qualified privilege, and we established the elements of conspiracy, uh, including the independent tort of conspiracy. You rest on the remainder of your brief, right? You rest on your brief? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. May it please the court. Uh, Todd Boyd on behalf of the Charter School Monroe uh, Appellees. Uh, we've agreed between counsel to split the 20 minutes, uh, so I'll take the 10 minutes. Anything I have left with the court's permission, I'd like to see to Mr. Burke as well. You, you want to split it 10 and 10? 10, 10. I'll just let you know when 10 is up, and if you're in the flow and you want to take more time and take some of his time away, that's up to you. Thank you. Turning to the qualified privilege that was discussed earlier, uh, the two exceptions, as noted by Judge Rothenberg. This is as to Monroe. As to Monroe. Right. Uh, the two exceptions would be publishing to too wide of an audience or statements made with malice. The record establishes that the only four people that Monroe published these statements to involved were the city manager, the HR director of the city of Aventura, in the two assistant principals, one of whom denies having known anything about this. But would you address the malice issue? Because the jury found that the statements that she made were false. Doesn't that infer malice? Now, the case law concerning qualified privilege holds that the malice cannot be inferred from the falsity of the statements. There must be more. There must be some ill will. There must be some hostility. There must be some under. Well, the jury made a finding that that this was a grant that this was a conspiracy and this the, that there was and according to the evidence the jury found that they basically colluded concocted a story and it was false doesn't that infer malice no not if the record does not support those findings and in this case turning to the malice, there's absolutely no evidence of any prior dispute, ill will, or anything that would have motivated Monroe to have done something like this to the appellant. Likewise, turning to the, the conspiracy account, there was no evidence whatsoever. The only evidence that the appellant adduced to trial was the testimony of one witness who testified that she saw the uh, appellee, Monroe, the city manager, Mr. Soroka, and a number of other, other individuals, two of whom were wearing suits that she assumed were attorneys, 
conversing about something at some point when the appellant was out of town. Next argument there is that the uh, is that Monroe maintained her job, received a promotion afterwards. There's no evidence, as there exists in some of the other cases cited by the appellant, of some pre-existing issue. In the Arpel case, there was a concern that the defendant had, had been involved in an altercation with the plaintiff previously because he was concerned he was going to leave his company and go to work for a competitor, had grabbed him by the lapels and yelled at him not to leave and was acting hysterical, according to the evidence. In that case, the court found there was some evidence to support malice and, as such, held the issue should be presented to the jury. In this case, the only evidence, directly from the appellant's testimony, is the only reason Ms. Monroe made any statements whatsoever to Mr. Soroka concerning the admission of Mr. Norman was because she was directed to do so by Mr. Soroka and she was directed to do so by the appellant and subsequently by the assistant principal, Ms. Alm, all of whom are supervisors of Ms. Monroe. The testimony of Ms. Monroe on the issue was very clear. She testified that Ms. Monroe did not, I don't know that she talked to anyone else outside of Soroka, Alm, Sandberg, and Applegreen, and that's in the transcript at page 944, and I'll excite to this tra transcript now is because I know there's been some accusations back and forth about the accuracy of some of the sites. So Ms. Monroe admits those are the only four people. Ms. Monroe then also goes on to testify as to the position that Mr. Soroka held in relationship to Ms. Monroe. And her testimony is that he had the ability to fire her or to have her fired. At uh, page 961 of the transcript, Ms. Monroe was there, uh, Ms. Murphy was asked, it's a relatively accurate statement then, correct, that you then told her, Monroe, when you got back, that she must respond to the email or suffer disciplinary actions. Not that you were going to do it, but that he, Soroka, was going to do it. Okay, would you agree with that? Yes, I would. Likewise, Ms. Soroka testified, or the appellant testified, so then, Monroe didn't have to listen to Eric Soroka under this hierarchy? Answer, she absolutely had to listen to Soroka. Her job depended on it. And that's at page 935. But wasn't there contrary, wasn't there other evidence in the record um, where other witnesses testified that they heard something very different than just her responding to a request from Mr. Soroka to provide information? That there was a conspiracy that they were concocting this story and she was told that if she didn't help in this conspiracy that she could lose her job or whatever. There was no evidence of any conspiracy between Mr. Soroka and Ms. Monroe. None of the other witnesses testified as to that? Not that there was a conspiracy. Not that those two came together to agree to fabricate information about Mrs. Monroe or the appellant to then circulate that information to others. All this appellee did. I mean, that was an allegation in the complaint. So you're saying there was no evidence to support that allegation at trial? There was no allegation, no facts to support that at trial. There's nothing cited in the initial or reply brief which would support that fact either. Again, in terms of the conspiracy count, the only record evidence cited by the appellant is the witnesses saw the individual's meeting talking about something and the fact that Monroe kept her job after the appellant was terminated. There is no evidence whatsoever of Soroka and Monroe getting together to concoct this, to come up with a plan for how they were going to do this, to plan how it would be disseminated. All Monroe did, again, at the direction of the appellant, going back to late November when the appellant was still employed by the school, was respond to an email from Mr. Soroka asking about whether there was support for the admission of the Norman child. That set in course a chain of events which led to a follow-up meeting between Mr. Soroka and Ms. Monroe. At that meeting, the HR director of the City of Aventura was brought to the meeting by Mr. Soroka, and the only other participant was Ms. Alm, the assistant principal, who Monroe had gone to for advice as to what to do because she felt uncomfortable given the conduct of the appellant. But there's no evidence she did anything more than that. What happened to the information once it was given to Mr. Soroka or to the HR director 
was not something that Monroe. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to ask you some other questions about the other uh, counts or the other claims. The first question I'd like to ask you is if you have an, an, an absolute privilege or let's say a qualified immunity or qualified privilege, either one, as to defamation, does that necessarily relate to the conspiracy? I know uh, my question is can you uh, be held responsible for conspiracy if you cannot be held responsible for the underlying defamation? Under the law I mean, of Florida. Conspiracy to defame. Under the floor, law of Florida, no, you cannot. There has to be an underlying tort for there to be a conspiracy. The case cited by appellant for that proposition involved uh, a conspiracy, essentially for the sake of a conspiracy claim, involving all the tobacco companies. But here, no, there would have to be some underlying tort because the size and magnitude of the alleged conspiracy here is small. The point of the decision, I think it was a Philip Morris decision decided by appellants, had to do with the fact that it involved all tobacco companies as opposed to a couple. Here the conspiracy at best would involve Soroka and Monroe. And again, the only case cited in the reply brief, at least on that issue, by the appellant is Bradley v. State. And the contention there is circumstantial evidence is sufficient to consider a conspiracy claim. And there's certainly some truth to that. But in the Bradley case, again, cited in the reply brief, uh, the evidence But in your legal research, and you've cited to cases that, that have held that you have to be held responsible for the underlying defamation in order to be also found mm -hmm. responsible for the conspiracy. But in your research, have you found any other cases that would conflict with that position? No, outside of the Philip Morris case cited by the appellants, no. And in the Bagley case cited by, or the Bradley case cited by the appellants, in that case the evidence was overwhelming. It was a uh, wife and uh, second person who had conspired to murder her husband because she was ha he was having an affair with a teenage who, teenager who lived in her house. They had evidence not only from the co-conspirators themselves, but they had evidence from other conspirators that participated in attempting to make the murder look like a burglary. Case not even close to here, where there's absolutely no evidence that Monroe and Soroka discussed this in any way at all, other than uh, at the direction of Soroka disclosing what Ms. Monroe believed happened. Okay, and then would you address the, the intentional infliction of emotional distress? As to Monroe, there's simply no evidence of any outrageous conduct whatsoever. She responded to inquiries from Mr. Soroka, who, again, appellants testified. Uh, but as she, to Mr. Soroka, because the, the, the allegations are he is the one who made all of the offending remarks and comments to her. Correct. But as to, but Mrs. Mrs. Monroe wasn't found liable for intentional infliction of emotional distress. I'm sorry, what? M Mrs. Monroe wasn't found liable for intentional No, I'm saying as to Mr. Soroka. Yes. Mr. Soroka, the jury found, was liable for intentional infliction of emotional distress, and the trial court uh, granted judgment notwithstanding the verdict on that claim because the trial court found that it didn't rise to the level of outrageousness that's required under the case law. So I'd like you to address that. As to Mr. Soroka? Correct. Okay. If I could defer that to Mr. Oh, Soroka's I'm sorry. Counsel. I'm He's sorry. That, that was yeah. why you looked surprised. Yeah. I apologize. And, and one, just one last quick point. Sure, uh, go ahead. Ms. Monroe also was entitled to sovereign immunity. Under the charter school statute as set out in the brief, the charter school employees are entitled to the same sovereign immunity enjoyed by the city as an employee of the charter school of Aventura. She is entitled to immunity from suit barring proof of malice, ill will, or whatnot. And again, as argued previously in the briefs. Well, defamation would be ill will. If there, was evidence, if there was evidence of ill will. The defamation in this case, she had a qualified privilege, which our contention is she satisfied. And therefore, mm -hmm. there can be no ill will. There's but there's no, no sovereign immunity for defamation. I'm sorry, I don't think it, there's no sovereign immunity for an employee for defamation. If there was defamation in this case, but there was not. Oh, well, but you don't, I mean, if there's no defamation, defi well, right. right. I Fair understand. Enough. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. <clears throat> counsel? Good morning, and may it please the Court, my name is Michael Burke, and with Hudson Gill, we represent uh, Aventura City Manager Eric Soroka in this matter. To get to your question, Judge Rothenberg, and, and to preface it, uh, with what you said at the beginning of the argument, uh, the, there, there's been, there is a jury verdict, but 
the, the matter that's before you looks at what the evidence was at the close of the case and whether or not any reasonable jury could return a verdict on the claims presented. So really, it's not an issue about the verdict. It's an issue about the evidence. That's what's before, that's what's before you. With regard to your question on the intentional infliction of emotional distress, uh, that, as, as you know, is a question of law for the court as to whether or not the, the evidence in this case was presented to show conduct which was so outrageous enough that this rare and unusual tort uh, would be found to exist by the court so as to submit whether or not the conduct occurred to the jury. What we say is that what you see is a, about anywhere between 6 and 8 or 13 and 15. Well, those, are, there's, those are specific instances yes. that were addressed at the trial, but she testified that this was an ongoing a repeated sort of behavior. Fairly regular is is what is Correct. what she said, as I recall. And and what we what we say is that uh, in in this district, as in the other districts in Florida, in the case of workplace claims of intentional infliction of emotional distress by a former employee vis-a-vis -vis their supervisor at work, the courts have uniformly held that verbal abuse. And some of the language is quite graphic. The Williams versus Worldwide Flight Systems case, for instance, out of this district. Uh, verbal abuse, prolonged period of time, it's not sufficient, absent some non-negligible physical contact. And, and I think there's a good reason for that, because in the workplace, there, there is oftentimes acrimony uh, amongst supervisors and those that they supervise. And it's also true that uh, when people lose their job, they're sometimes very upset about that and they're unhappy about that. So I think you're gonna have, you would have a slew of cases with people claiming that essentially the, their supervisor was not civil to them. Well, and wouldn't that encourage better behavior at the workplace, a better working environment if, if the law you know, didn't have such a high threshold on abusive language. I, I you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. But uh, I, I would mean, suggest that would be policy. something for the legislature. I usually don't consider policy, but since you were arguing policy, that's why I asked you that question. Yeah, I, I think, I think that, uh, I think I don't know. Uh, I think if 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 that is if that step is to be taken, I think that it should be for the legislature. Now, in this case. The, uh, there were, of course, claims of hostile environment sexual harassment that were pursued fully in the federal district court and on appeal to the 11th Circuit, which were rejected. So here you have a case wherein the conduct complained of was not sufficiently severe or pervasive to constitute an objectively hostile work environment under, under federal discrimination and state discrimination law, but yet the claim is being made that this court should, based on uh, profane and vulgar language, sticks and stones, uh, uh, send, send a case to the jury, which, which they did, of course, the judge did because uh, uh, she deferred ruling, in which they come back with $20 million in, uh, in, uh, in, in tangible damages. Uh, this is not a viable claim. The, the claim that's presented is not viable. The, the only thing besides this verbal abuse, which is in the record, uh, and we have to take that from Dr. Murphy's testimony and accept it as true. The only other thing is this, this claim about the police officers delivering. delivering I, I don't think you need to spend right. any time on mm -hmm. so that. So that, that we don't, we don't, there's really nothing else. I, I think in their brief they mentioned that there was an opposition to the claim of unemployment compensation. Well, you know, these aren't things that are totally un, un, unusual in a civilized <laughs> society. People do contest unemployment claims. Uh, there is, unfortunately, um, uh, profane and vulgar language in the workplace. There is uh, occasions where paperwork gets delivered, uh, be it by police officers or otherwise, and these things are not the kinds of things that give rise to this really very unusual tort that, that arises under very, very, very unusual facts. And uh, one of those kinds of things where when the facts are so extreme, it's so obscene. Yeah, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't, I don't agree with you that the case law requires some kind of physical touching 
along with the verbal abuse because there are cases where the courts have found that the conduct was so outrageous by, for example, making the phone call and saying your child has been killed or something. Uh, it didn't require any touching. I agree with you on But it was so outrageous that for eight hours they thought their, their child was dead that they found that that rose to the level of, you know, intentional outrageous. infliction of emotional distress. So uh, it doesn't require touching, but the cases that do find it very often involve the touching aspect. I agree with Your Honor. I think in the workplace that the language of vulgar language in the workplace, and I understand what you're, you're, you're giving an example, and it is, it, it was so found based on verbal conduct, but in the workplace where you're talking about verbal harassment, absent physical contact, I don't think you're going to find a case where the language has risen to that level in the workplace. it's just harassment. That's right. Uh, to, to go on, the defamation the defamation claim, uh, we have asserted in our brief uh, that there, there wasn't a defamatory statement by uh, Mr. Soroka, that the claim was barred by the applicable two-year statute of limitations. I'll rest on our brief and just deal with the, the issue that is so direct, which is, which is absolute immunity. The Court I, is obviously aware of the McNair case. Uh, same principles that apply to legislative and judicial officials apply to executive officials. Mr. Soroka. Uh, was clearly acting within the course of his duties and course of his function when he uh, addresses media inquiries regarding the termination of the uh, city's charter school principal, when he speaks with parents. In fact, the, the testimony was that really he didn't say anything to anybody at all about this, pretty much. I mean, he, the Miami Herald asked him for comment, and he says, you know, I I'm not going to give you the exact reasons. That's what he said. Now, they managed to get, get out of there that it couldn't wait to the end of the year and we needed a change in leadership. Uh, he speaks to one parent who he repeatedly refused to, she was an attorney here locally, Ms. Berkowitz, a very persuasive woman. Uh, uh, he repeatedly refused to tell her why he had uh, terminated uh, uh, Dr. Murphy. Eventually, he indicates it's a matter related to this Norman uh, child. Now, of course, he denies that, but Ms. Berkowitz's testimony has to be accepted as true. Uh, but clearly, uh, she comes to his office, speaks to him in his office about this. Uh, this is clearly within the scope of his function. Um, the Florida Supreme Court has held that the scope is not just mandatory duties, but discretionary duties. That's the, the uh, Wardlow case. Um, Raisha versus Tucker, which, the, which, which Your Honor have, has brought up. Uh, the, the issue of whether or not the official was acting within the scope of some mandatory or discretionary function is for the court. Uh, you know, waiver. Let me address waiver. Um, Mr. Soroka moved for summary judgment. <clears throat> Mr. Soroka moved for directed verdict on the issue of absolute immunity at the close of, all, of, close of the plaintiff's case in chief. The judge deferred. Mr. Soroka moved for summary judgment on that issue at the close of all the evidence. The judge deferred. Uh, the judge is now prepared to submit the case to the jury. She still has the motion for directed verdict under advisement. And it comes time that the jury be instructed. Well, we didn't sit back and say, we're not going to participate in jury instructions because you've decided to submit it to the jury. That's not waiver. We, you know, the motion's still pending. The motion that, that is the subject of this appeal uh, wasn't ruled on until after the verdict, and there's certainly no waiver to any of that by, by virtue of Soroka's actions. With regard to um, uh, media uh, communications by the city manager, many of these cases dealing with the absolute privilege and, and absolute immunity involve media communications. It's not unusual. Local government is, is very well thought of in, in the, the local media, and they, they, they take a great interest in it. And uh, so it's not unusual that many of these cases emanate from statements made in the media. Um, the tortious interference claim. Uh, Mr. Soroka, he was the city manager. He was in charge of hiring and firing for all city employees. Dr. Murphy was the equivalent of a department head. She was his direct report. Um, he, in fact, negotiated the terms under which she would work there. Uh, he supervised right, counsel, her. I'd like yeah. to change the subject slightly, and that is, yes. <clears throat> Amicus suggests that the court should look at 
the idea of absolute immunity. Um, and in other areas, in the cases that you're relying on, on, by and large, are several decades old. And in other areas, the court has, the Florida Supreme Court has, has, has trended towards more qualified immunity than absolute immunity. And I wonder if you could address that issue. Well, I, I would I would say that the I don't think that they have addressed in the context of judicial, legislative, or executive officials the the erosion of absolute immunity. Uh, I guess when I say absolute immunity, I guess it's absolute privilege. And that's correct. Yeah. Absolute immunity for defamation. Absolute privilege. Uh, <clears throat> the you know the. The courts have, have been uniform with respect to that uh, throughout this period of time. I don't think that, uh, that the court would look at e examining uh, the opinions of the judiciary, should be looking at uh, eroding that principle, and, and because it's based on this. It, it really quotes from, if you look at McNair footnote 12, it's got, it's got a quote in there from Learned Hand. The Florida Supreme Court adopts the Barr versus Mateo, which is the, uh, the federal standard uh, as it relates to this absolute privilege theory. Right. And there are some current cases. I mean, Cassell is 2007 out of the fourth. Oh, yes. I From the district the, courts, yes. The most recent. Also yes. 2008. So it isn't that any court at this point has attempted to uh, receive from this in some way to get it somehow to the Florida Supreme Court. Yes, I agree. 1996 with Raisha, I think, would be the last Florida Supreme Court addressing of the absolute privilege issue. But it's really it's based on this principle, which exists as well today. Believe me, if you were to ask Mr. Soroka, he would have loved to have had this decided much earlier than, 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 than it was here. It's, it's better to leave, and this is the principle under which this is based, it's better to leave unredressed the wrongs done by dishonest officers than to subject those who try to do their duty to the uh, constant dread of retaliation no matter how false, no matter how malicious. Now, these people, you've you got to get people to work and to serve in, in government. And if, uh, if people and if people can constantly get back at them for simply explaining why they've taken certain actions, uh, you know, they're exposed. And, and, and just as if this court were, were to be exposed to fear of suit for that which you do as part of your judicial duties. I mean, you have to get people to serve. Well, but there, there is certainly a difference, and I, I don't think you're defending the conduct if, in fact, the conduct was true. It, we, 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 absolutely. And, and, should, and what there the should be some, some mechanism, some legal remedy that doesn't permit that kind of conduct when it gets to a certain point, at least. I mean, it's understandable that, you know, tempers can flare. You can make a, a comment in passing that is inappropriate. But if it's a repeated sort of thing, and it is, and it's, and it's pretty, you know, pretty awful conduct, you know, language, that there should be some remedy. You're not saying that there should always be that protection no matter how bad it gets. You are referring to the intentional infliction or the no, absolute no, pri the no, privilege? No, I'm talking about the defamation. Defamation. Well, and really there is. If you look at some of the cases here, they say, you know, while, while, the, while the remedy may not be money damages because of the privilege, uh, it does not stop people from coming forward and speaking out about it, from going to the press about it. They're dealing with public officials, so those public officials have to be responsive to uh, that which occurs around them. So they're not sitting there uh, able to hide from, from the uh, 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 response of the person who, who believes they have been wrong. So these people have to, they're out there, just like they're out there when the Miami Herald comes to ask, why did you fire the city manager, or why did you fire the, uh, fire the uh, principal, if, if people take these. And, 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 and she did have a remedy. She could have gone back to her original position, which was a higher paying position, at any time if she thought the, the behavior was so offensive that it was affecting her. Absolutely. Absolutely. She never once wanted to do that. Loved her job and is very upset that she lost her job. And that's really what this case is about. It's about someone who loved their job and is upset that they lost their job. And the, and the basic facts are that, that this person, it came to Mr. Soroka's attention that this person had been let into the school 
um, without going through proper procedures, without going through the lottery. This is a very sought after uh, school. Places in the school are sought after. And, you know, Mrs. You know, Soroka got the runaround, and he went went back and said, "Tell me what happened, or you know, I'm going to take some action." Well, that's that's Soroka's version, but it looks like the jury rejected that quite quite uh, deeply. Well, again, and as I said I mean, at the beginning this, of the this argument, this jury was unhappy with Soroka's conduct. They definitely were, and when when told in closing argument that uh, you know he's uh, he's Richard Nixon incarnate, they were they were they were. You know, they were angry, and uh, there's, so there's there's reasons. And, for and all they these rejected things. Soroka's claims, the ones that you're now. They did, but as, as as we said at the beginning of the argument, the issue is not what the jury did. The issue is what was the evidence at the close of all the at the close of the case. And the evidence at the close of all the case is there there was a dispute between Monroe and Murphy about who let this child in. There is no evidence, zero, that that Soroka sought to manipulate something uh, uh, about that. Monroe says, Dr. Murphy did it, and she's forcing me now to take the blame for it. Murphy says, no, Monroe did that, and now I'm getting blamed for it. Uh, you know, and here's Soroka. He doesn't know what happened except what he's told. And there's no evidence to, to, to dispute that. And the fact that some people come by and have some meetings at the school with the city manager from time to time, uh, I would respectfully suggest that's not enough to show a conspiratorial agreement to manipulate this wild story. Council, we, we've let you go way over. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much for your time. We ask that you uh, affirm the decision of the trial court here. Thank you very much. The court, is, the court has had significant questions about the absolute immunity, and the focus is. It's really absolute privilege. Absolute privilege. Yeah. The focus is city manager is everything the city manager does when directed by the Mima Herald or asked within his scope and course. And there are three reasons to reject as the jury did and frankly as the parties did in waiving this issue and making it clear at the outset of the case this was a jury question. One, the court's right. This was a city-owned school. This was not a city-operated school. It was operated by CSUSA, number one. Number two. Principal was uh, hired by the private corporation or by the city? By both. The principal was hired by joint action and served both as principal and, the evidence shows, as a city department head. Direct report to the city manager? Yes. Okay. Number two, the activity that Soroka did in conjunction with this defamation, nothing done from the dais, Nothing done from a press conference, nothing done from any activity that gives the force of office. And that leads but to. But wasn't he her direct supervisor who was responsible for supervising her and, and well, supervising her? Well, there's no doubt, subject to the management contract, which is there's lots of testimony about that in terms of what that did. But we've cited a case, the Proxmire case, and it's so critical on this issue, this issue of absolute privilege, absolute immunity. Statements permissible on the Senate floor are nonetheless impermissible from the Senator's office. Soroka acting in a press conference fashion may in fact be an official course and scope. Soroka acting to give a statement of justification and... But he, he was also... Uh, as he was required to, he was involved with the hiring, the supervision, and the removal of, of all of the city employees for which she is one. So when somebody asks him directly, why <coughs> did you <coughs> remove her, you're saying that he has to be in an open press conference <coughs> to answer that question? Yes, Judge, because here's what he says. Quote, and this is a lie. Quote, the fact of the matter is the two vice principals have essentially been running the day-to-day -day operations of the school, end quote. Two people who are not employed by him have no supervisory responsibility to him. He directs the media to the management function 
of CSUSA not having any responsibility but of the talking. Buck, the buck pass, you know, stops with him. He's the city manager. He is administering all of the city's affairs, which includes the hiring, the supervision, and the firing of city employees. But so that he may have people under him, but he's still the spokesman because it's his job. He, he's the one who has to answer to the commission. He's the one who has to answer to the public not his employees, the people under and, him. And that's going to be the issue for this court to decide. There is the issue when he speaks in a capacity that talks about people who are not city employees, not subject to his supervision, when he speaks in an well, operational hey, capacity about- the principal? The two vice principals have essentially been running the day-to-day -day operations of the school. These okay, two that, people- that, 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 is that who you're referring to? In other words, the city manager talking about the two vice principals was talking about people who were not within the city government. Correct. And that's, that's part of the lie that he makes. That's, that's false. We have proved, the jury agreed, and we proved at trial that was false. I thought and the school was owned by the city. The school was owned by the city. It was, it was not, operated by? It was operated by CSUSA, the manager company Even though under the contract. principal was a city employee. Right. But could, the, by the way, who could fire the principal? This private corporation or the city? Well, the, if, if you look at the contract agreement, they both have the, the ability to do that. What, then isn't the city, in, at least in part, operating the facility if they can fire the person in charge of it? I mean, that would seem like an operational thing to me. Not, not all. And the management agreement makes that very clear. Operations is CSUSA. But that's... Well, I'm not sure I agree with you. It seems to me, from my review, as this is a municipal... Uh, it was a... Uh, a school that was operated by the city of Aventura with the assistance of CSUSA and it was governed by the city commission. Is that correct or incorrect? I, I don't want to quibble, Judge. It was owned by the city. It was operated by CSUSA and the board of the school board for the school was the city commission. So like the, the Miami-Dade County School Board is the city commission. And that's how it works as the charter school works. The city was not the operator of the charter school, and that makes a big difference in this particular case. I thought it was kind of a, a co-thing, that, uh, that the city operated this school with the assistance of CSUSA. The city contracted with CSUSA in the management agreement to operate the school. CSUSA operated the school in all capacities, and that's why there's a dual reporting responsibility to Dr. Murphy. And the court mentions, by the way, she could have gone back to get her job. When she gets fired, we believe inappropriately, but fired, CSUSA says there's no job there for you anymore, and we argue they breached that contract and, and we had a count there. But to move on beyond the, the in the quick time that's left, beyond the, uh, the absolute uh, privilege issue, the we have the, the focus that he's not acting, in our view, factually and legally in the capacity of city manager. But in addition, the, the court has asked questions and there was considerable well, who, discussion. Who can fire um, the principal? Is it the city commission or the city manager? The city manager. The, the, we, we haven't disputed that. The city manager is able to do what, uh, do what he wants with employees. She was not a civil service entitled entitled to civil service protection at the time. The circumstances Well, I guess my concern is, I mean, if the city manager can fire the principal, then uh, decisions and statements made regarding the firing of the principal seem to be within the course and scope of his employment. Well, and, and, and that, that's easy to say, Judge Logue, in a general sense. What were the statements and what was the context of the statements? And that's why I point out that in Soroka's justification, false justification, he doesn't talk about the city department. He doesn't talk about the city employee. He talks about others who are not within his scope whatsoever. And that shows that he stepped beyond the function of being city manager, and instead he's acting as the CSUSA representative effectively. And I mean, that's why this who is does he talk? Who does he talk to about others? Not the Miami Herald. Yes. He, the Miami Herald, he said it was necessary to have a change in leadership 
and that while normally an action like this would wait until the end of the school year, the circumstances wouldn't allow that. How does he refer to anyone in Tran that statement other than her? Your Honor, respectfully, transfer page 1788, page 1788. Soroka said, quote, the fact of the matter is the two vice principals have essentially been running the day-to-day -day operations of the school, end quote. Testimony right there. And that takes us outside of this even discretionary management function. I want to move to the outrageousness because the outrageousness is a function of the context. Here, a school context, we have consistent beating down day after day, verbal abuse coupled with action, affirmative action that, yes, we may quibble over sending armed police officers, I think it was 40 miles outside to not only give a directive to Dr. Murphy, but to instruct her that she's not allowed to return to the school with her children, coupled with the daily consistent embarrassment and the fact that this activity is not just to Dr. Murphy, but it is observed by and known by the people who deal in that school. It essentially becomes the ruination of Dr. Murphy, this world-renowned individual. So that's the inter intentional infliction of emotional distress. And I know my time is up, but I simply want to ask the Court to note on the Monroe qualified immunity issue, we don't even get there. The law says, and we've cited the case, third DCA case, Charles versus Florida floor foreclosure. You don't even get to the privilege where, I apologize, Judge, that's on the conspiracy case. Uh, you don't even get to the privilege where malice, maliciousness is involved, where wrongful motive is involved, and we showed wrongful motive many different ways, starting from Dr. Murphy disciplining Nicole Monroe for misconduct, reporting Nicole Monroe for misconduct, but giving her a chance, putting Nicole Monroe essentially on the disciplinary circuit. Then Nicole Monroe acting, and the evidence was very clear, to protect her job and to protect her two children who were in school. She acts to lie, and the evidence showed it was a lie, to lie about Dr. Murphy having committed criminal activity to protect herself at a time when... And the lie regarding the uh, admission of the other kid? I didn't hear What that. was the lie? It was the, li the, the lie was of about the child? Uh, bringing in other kids in outside violation the of the lottery, oh. outside the lottery. That's it. Okay. And, the jury, the and jury the awarded only $5,000 nominal damages to, Murf, uh, to uh, Monroe on the defamation claim, well, correct? We, yes, Your Honor. And I mean, no actual damages, $5,000 nominal damages. Yes, Judge, and Nicole Monroe, the evidence showed, didn't have any money. That was a rec recognition that she did wrong, serious wrong, but the jury was not going to ruin her. Her employer, on the other hand, and this is where the conspiracy comes in, the active conspiracy activity, and there is abundant evidence, and I want to remind the Court of the evidence because the appellees say there is no evidence, the abundant evidence that Soroka, Monroe, and others met while Dr. Murphy was out sick, that they met to talk about moving her out, that they met to talk about the misconduct that Dr. Murphy had engaged in. And Nicole Monroe is a participant in that, not just with CSUSA, not just with Eric Soroka, but with an entire group of people. And the law says it is not required, and this is the third DCA case, Charles versus Florida foreclosure, it is not required that each individual conspirator be found to have committed the underlying tort. Quote, each conspirator need not act to further a conspiracy. Each need only know of the scheme and assist in it in some way to be held responsible for all of the acts of his conspirators. Mr. Un Kennedy, we'd underlying like to court is way there. Over. We ask for reversal for all the reasons set out in the briefs and at oral argument. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of the attorneys.